Good morning and welcome to STEM Ambassadors Live and today I'm joined by Paul McMahon. Now Paul is a retired consultant that used to work for Airbus and he's going to speak today um, with his talk titled How a Mechanical Engineer Helped Turn Scientists' Dreams into Reality. So I'm going to hand over to Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to take you through my... Uh, my life in the space industry. Um, I retired from uh, from Airbus uh, Defence and Space after spending 43 and a bit years working for them um, in, in, in the space industry, working with people across Europe. Um, and I spent a lot of my time working in the mechanism department and uh, as, as head of that department. Um, I passed when I was at school at uh, age 11, we had an exam called the 11 plus, which I passed. Um, which meant I went to uh, secondary technical, uh, uh, Luton Secondary Technical School. Um, and I left school at 16 with five O levels. Um, there wasn't such a big drive for everybody to go to university at that time. Uh, and I didn't go to university. I did an engineering apprenticeship with uh, a company in Luton. Um, and I studied mechanical engineering at Luton College of Further Education. Um, I started work in August 1975 with what was then Hawke Siddeley Dynamics, um, which eventually became Airbus Defence and Space. Um, and I worked on over 40 space programmes, a few of them I was project manager. Uh, and I've been involved in over 100 pieces of hardware in orbit around the Earth. Um, and there's a couple of some of my hardware sitting on the surface of Mars and also on a comet out by the orbit of Jupiter. Um, I became the ExoMars Rover Deputy Project Manager in 2012. Um, and although I didn't have a, a, a BSc, my studies at Luton College were the equivalent of a, a degree, but the course wasn't accredited to, to degree level. Uh, and eventually I did get a, a BSc from the Open University in uh, 2013. Um, and recently I was rehired by Airbus as a consultant to support uh, some spacecraft that I supplied hardware to in the 1990s. So first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about Airbus. Uh, Airbus is an enormous European wide uh, engineering conglomerate, uh, most famous for its, its air, aeroplanes. Um, this in the top left hand corner is the A380. It was a bit of a vanity project, really, if I'm honest, it, uh, they no longer make, we no longer make it. Uh, it wasn't a commercial success. Um, uh, and I think it was only done to prove to Boeing that we could do it. Uh, Boeing are our biggest competitor. Um, the next aircraft along is the European Fighter Assembly, which uh, was built uh, between uh, most of the countries in Europe. I think France, Germany, Spain and Italy and the UK were the main contributors. Um, and the way these big European projects work is that... Uh, Countries put so much money into the project and they get so much work out of it. And the agreement with the European Fighter Assembly was that each country agreed to buy so many aircraft when it went into production. Um, and that's a way of keeping the costs down and then also getting uh, getting work into, into various countries. Uh, the centre picture is uh, uh, part of uh, Eurocopter, which the remnants of the UK helicopter industry got absorbed into. The other three pictures are part of the space industry. Bottom left is a Eurostar communications uh, satellite. And this is fairly typical of uh, communication satellite platforms. So the central body is, is, the, is the main part of the spacecraft. You have two solar arrays sticking out, each, one out each side normally, that take power from the sun and convert it into uh, electrical energy. And then you have a collection of reflectors on this on the two side walls uh, that are used to communicate to, to transmit information to the earth be it tv broadcast a radio broadcast or telephone uh, conversation etc uh, over on the right we have a picture of ariam 5 which is the current european workhorse for putting uh, satellites into orbit this is coming to the end of its life and is due to be replaced by Ariane 6 next year, I think. Um, and uh, uh, it can launch, I think it's something like 20 tonnes into low Earth orbit and about eight tonnes into what's called geostationary orbit. Um, and this uh, 
bottom right hand picture is what's called the automated transfer vehicle, which was the European uh, contribution to the uh, International Space Station. Um, so this was used to supply, it wasn't used to supply uh, ferry astronauts to the International Station, but uh, to supply equipment, uh, experiments, um, gas, fuel, uh, air and food and water, etc. Uh, up to the International uh, Space Station to help the astronauts live up there. We only ever made six of those. It was a real pity we didn't make more. Um, but the central body of this um, and, and many of the equipments developed for this are being used on part of the, uh, the NASA's uh, next attempt to go to the moon with the uh, um, space launch system that uh, they've had a few attempts at launching recently uh, and is due for another launch attempt soon. So this is a picture of uh, European Space Agency, some of the projects that uh, they've been uh, they've done over the last uh, 50 years now. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these. There's just too many. Uh, but this represents about a third of all the projects that the European Space Agency has been involved with over the last uh, 50 years. And I've been involved with these five along the bottom uh, and this one here. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about them in great detail. This is Ulysses, which was the first spacecraft to fly over the poles of the sun. Um, Soho, which sits uh, on the sunward side of the Earth, at what's called the Lagrange One position. Uh, and it looks at the sun all day and takes photographs of the sun and helps to um, uh, predict what's happening on the sun uh, and the way it influences what happens on the Earth. XMM. Uh, which is uh, an X-ray telescope launched in 1999. Um, uh, it's like the Hubble, but it sees in it records information from X-rays, not from the visible light. Uh, Europe's most successful satellite. Uh, its sister satellite, Integral, which uh, looks at gamma rays. Um, uh, and uh, these are the two satellites that I've been rehired as a consultant to, to make sure that the hardware I supplied keeps the spacecraft flying for another 10 years or so. Lisa Pathfinder uh, was, is part of a, a, a precursor to a family of satellites that will be used to measure gravity waves in orbit. Very difficult to measure them. And we've only just managed to do it on Earth after a long a lot of effort. Uh, and, but it will be a lot easier, easier in orbit. Uh, Rosetta, uh, this was a truly amazing project to be part of. I cannot tell you how proud I am to have been part of this project. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, so, yeah, I worked at Airbus for 43 years and the number of different tasks and skills that I had to learn and develop and use during those 43 years was was amazing. Uh, it stuff that uh, there was no way I would know about when I left uh, when I finished my studies. Um, uh, but uh, and this is just skimming the surface of all the sort of things I used to do. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I just don't have the time. But uh, touch briefly on a couple of mass estimates. We think mass estimates. We just weigh the spacecraft when we built it. That's, that's yeah, very simplistic approach to it. But if we arrived at the launch site and we weighed the satellite when we finished building it and said to the guy who owns the rocket, it weighs six tonnes and he comes and says, well, I can only lift five tonnes, then you're totally screwed. So what happens is from almost day one of the project, you have to know how much your spacecraft is going to weigh and not only that you know have to know the fidelity of the information you have about the mass of all the components that go on to the the spacecraft you have to know exactly how many nuts bolts and washers you're going to have how many kilometers of cable you're going to have what size cable you're going to have um, and so forth so that when you come to weigh it it weighs what you think it's going to weigh uh give or take a little bit um so you know Life is never very easy. There's always a lot more to, to what on first uh, appearance is a very simple uh, topic. Um, XMR's rover Biobird, and I spent the last uh, nearly 20 years, uh, surprisingly, working on projects to go to Mars and also on XMR's rover, which unfortunately is stuck on the Earth because uh, Putin decided to invade Ukraine. Um, but we're going to Mars to look for evidence of Martian life. We're not going to Mars to look for evidence of life 
earth life that we took with us. Um, so we have to, we built a sterile clean room to build the Mars rover in, and we have to make sure that that sterile clean room was sterile. There was no bugs or, or, or spores in that clean room so that when the, the rover leaves Earth, it is as clean as we can make it. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that later on. So this is uh, talking about Rosetta. This is uh, the hardware that I was responsible for. These are reaction wheels, these four black domes here. They're high inertia disks. They spin all day at high speed. Um, and what they do is uh, when they want to rotate the spacecraft in orbit, they speed up or slow down the, the wheel, transfer inner energy in and out of the, the wheel. And in doing so, they slew the spacecraft across the sky. Top left-hand corner here, is what I think is the best selfie ever taken. Uh, this was taken by a camera on Philae, which was a lander bolted to the side of Rosetta. Here you have the back surface of the solar array, and in the background is the picture of the comet that uh, Rosetta was sent out to investigate. Um, and this is a picture of Philae uh, about uh, 10 or 15 seconds after it left Rosetta on its way down onto the, uh, onto the comet. This was a very, very uh, impressive mission in, in many, many ways. And the, the task of putting Philae down onto the comet was this in the press was described as like uh, chucking a, a washing machine out of the back of a jumbo jet and getting it to land on, the, on a trailer, on a train, speeding across the ground at, uh, 200 miles an hour below it. So that was very, very difficult. Um, but it was a truly amazing program. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, an animation of Rosetta in orbit around the comet. And where it did these violent turns, the reaction wheels did all of that. As the spacecraft was coming along here, they wanted to slew it round very quickly. The reaction wheels did all that hard work. Um, the Ariane release gear was the first uh, project I worked on. Um, and uh, this is Ariane LO1, uh, and my hardware is down here in amongst uh, all the exhaust plume of the the, uh, the, the rocket. This is me, um, age 28, I think at the time, 28, 26. Uh, and uh, out there, this is LO2, the second launch of Ariane. Unfortunately, the launch went wrong and it was destroyed just over a minute into the launch. Um, so this is a picture of my hardware, this white uh, equipment here, about uh, two or three hundred milliseconds after liftoff. Uh, and the object of this hardware was to control the rate at which the rocket left the ground. Uh, and to do that, what we did, we had to release the load retaining the, the rocket on the ground to within this hatched uh, diagram. Uh, and why do we do that? Uh, well, you can equate the, the launch vehicle, the rocket, to a, a series of spring mass systems. So the mass is the engine, the fuel tanks are quite spongy, you can equate them to a spring, and you can do that for all the three stages of the rocket. And what happens if you kick this mass at the bottom here too hard, then you set up uh, a resonant vibration, and that excites the second mass, that excites the third mass, and that excites the top mass on their spring system. And the rocket will shake itself to bits if you don't get it right. It's quite simple. Uh, one of the other things I used to do was separation analysis. I loved doing separation analysis. I love writing the mathematical model uh, and getting the data out and uh, analyzing it. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, so what we do for it, this thing, there was a device called ACU 1663. Uh, I would start off by generating a free body diagram. This is ACU 1663, it's a carbon fiber cone with some ejection springs. Then we'd have a dummy satellite uh, and we'd compensate it for a counterbalance mass. And from this diagram, um, I would uh, generate the equations of motions uh, and then I would run the mathematical model which would predict how it, how it performed. Uh, and I wrote the mathematical model but about uh, two months before we did the test uh, and I got this result out here. So this, this blue line here was the, uh, was the prediction for the displacement. And I, this flat in the middle here, I could not understand. I thought the mathematical model was incorrect uh, and there was something wrong, flawed with the equations. And I 
I worked at it, worked at it, worked at it, and I couldn't get rid of this fact. And then when we did the test, we got this red line here. So my prediction, my mathematical model was pretty close to the actual prediction. Um, another project I worked on was Swarm. These are three satellites flying in a constellation above the Earth's atmosphere to measure the, uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and we had this, this boom, which 4.3 meters long, uh, which is stowed down the front of the spacecraft. This is the three spacecraft inside the cone of the rocket. There's the hinge at the top. Uh, and I wrote the mathematical model to describe the motion of the boom as it uh, was released. Uh, and uh, so this was my prediction. This is the start of the deployment at minus 160 degrees. Uh, and it oscillated backwards and forwards. The first uh, it went through the, the uh, null point you know, the deployed position, then it overswang by 60 degrees and then oscillated backwards and forwards. So that was the rotation. And then I add to it, this produces the velocity that the boom is uh, uh, experiencing as it goes through this motion. And then this, then you get the torque or the acceleration of the, the boom as it moves through the, uh, uh, through its deployment sequence. I was two seconds out, by the way. Um, it says that it come to rest after 120 seconds, but I was a couple of seconds out, which I think is pretty good. And this is the, the mathematical model. 50 lines of code describes it perfectly. Um, so like I said earlier, I, I spent uh, 28, 20 years or so working on projects related to going to Mars. Beagle 2, which was the UK's attempt to put a Martian lander on the, uh, put a lander on the surface of Mars, and also Rosalind Franklin, the ExoMars rover, you can see here on the right. Uh, so Beagle 2 was launched in the June 2003, was due to land on Christmas Day, but it didn't phone home. Um, and we thought it was lost forever, but eventually we did find it in January 15. Uh, and it looks like only um, two or three of the four solar array panels had deployed. And unfortunately, there's a radio antenna underneath the fourth, uh, fourth solar panel. And without that deployment, we, uh, we couldn't talk to the to Beagle. So that's real pity. So XMR's rover. This is due to go to Mars. It's now going to be six years before it goes because they've got to uh, the part of the project the Russians were supplying. We have to do within Europe or the States. Um, so that's a real pity. But uh, there we go. So the beauty of uh, ExoMars is it's got a drill on the front here, and that's going to drill two meters below the surface of Mars, take a sample, and then it's going to analyze it for evidence of life. Um, and the belief is if there is any life on, on Mars, it will be below the surface because the top, the surface of Mars is, uh, is not like Earth. Uh, it's bathed in UV light and UV radiation, uh, and it's not very hospitable to life. So um, if it's underground, uh, it stands a better chance of surviving. Uh, getting down onto the surface of Mars is very, very difficult. Um, the atmosphere is a lot thinner than on Earth. Um, and the, the probe comes in at the top top of the at, surf, uh, top of the Martian atmosphere, about twenty five thousand kilometers an hour, uh, and in the next seven, seven minutes we have to reduce that speed down to zero so that it lands safely. Um, so one of the things I was responsible for on, on XMRs was the verification, uh, and we have loads and loads of models. This is the flight model that we're delivering here and a ground test model. And all of these other models are geared towards conveying information or hardware onto the, the, the flight model to prove that it will work before we launch it. The most important of these is the structural test model. This is the one that does vibration testing, thermal testing before we get the flight model so that we're happy that all of our models, uh, our theoretical models, um, our software models represent the uh, the flight hardware and that when we get to the test we don't get any any surprises now the other thing that's unusual about xmrs is the amount of software that's on board um, and as a result we have four different versions of the software uh, and the software will get up up 
updated in flight once the rover has been delivered to the, landed on uh, on the surface and it goes through loads and loads of iterations as we add more and more functionality to that software so the other, one of the other projects i part of the project i was involved in this is a mars yard which is uh, set to replicate the surface of mars in terms of sand and rocks 300 tons of sand a couple of tons of rocks uh, and the mars rover the prototype Mars rovers are allowed, uh, driven around their surface to try and develop the software for the navigation systems. Um, so this is the one of the latest uh, prototypes of the ExoMars rover, and this is designed to replicate the flight rover. And you say, well, there's, you know, there's not a lot of similarity there. Uh, but what you've got to remember is that, first of all, Martian gravity is a third of Earth. So whereas the, the flight rover weighs about 300 kilograms, once it's down on the surface of Mars, it's the equivalent of 100 kilograms. So our prototypes on Earth have to weigh about 100 kilograms. So we get the correct interaction between the wheels and the sand uh, on the soil on the surface. Otherwise, we, we're, not, we're not replicating it very well. Um, and this is tall and thin to get the center of gravity in roughly the right position. Uh, we've got a mast here with some cameras on the top at roughly the right height. Uh, we don't need the solar panels on Earth because we power it from a, uh, from a separate power supply. But the locomotion system is very close to the flight unit, certainly in terms of its geometry, the size of the wheels, the position of the wheels, and how much they can turn and rotate and so forth. And the other thing I, I looked after was the, the sterile clean room, which I mentioned earlier, uh, where we built the Mars rover. Uh, we had, were allowed to deliver the rover with 9,800 spores on it on the surface. Um, now, you know, that sounds quite a, quite a large number, but believe, believe you me, you on your body have got millions of spores, millions of bugs, millions of microbes, and, and inside your, your gut, you've got millions as well. So, you know, delivering something with only 9,800 seemed an impossible target, but we did it. Uh, and so when we built the, this is a plan view of the, the clean room. Uh, this is the room here, which you just saw in the photograph. And just after we built it, we did a deep clean and then we did a survey of the spores that could be uh, identified on the, on the building. Um, now this area here, TNTC, too numerous to count. This is the changing rooms. This is where people come in, take all their clothes off and put on uh, what are called bunny suits, which is a complete uh, boiler suit lots of face masks, gloves, a bit like what you saw with doctors and nurses in the recent uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak. Um, so it's not surprising that the clean room is the dirtiest place because all of the dirt, all of the, the, the microbes and spores that come into the clean room come in with us. We are by far and above the dirtiest thing that went into the clean room. But after this, we initiated as a, um, a a process of cleaning the clean the changing room every day and uh and then we did another survey and you can see this and the the effect of cleaning this area thoroughly every day has an impact across the building uh, as you can see so what what does the future hold for the space industry I'm nearly out of time so when I started at Stevenage in 75, there was only one white, non-white male engineer and only one female engineer. Uh, and when I left, there was uh, people from virtually every country in Europe uh, and also across the world, not, not every country in the world, but certainly a large number of people everywhere across the world. And there was a large number of women as well. Probably 30% of the engineers were women. Um, and what, what do we need? Well, there's opportunities for chemists, electrical engineers, mathematicians, statisticians, metallurgists, test engineers, people with all sorts of different sorts of knowledge. Um, and, uh, and, and then as we start to talk about going to Mars, uh, you know, you've got human beings going to Mars. They're going to be away for a couple of years at least. Um, those people are going to have all sorts of needs. Um, you're, going to, you're going to need doctors uh, and so forth because those people will, will experience problems. Um, so it's uh, people who you know, understand how to try and grow stuff um, and in vastly different conditions to what we have here on Earth. 
So almost every job or skill required on Earth will be needed in some form or other on the other planets. Um, so, so I um, thoroughly enjoyed my career uh, as an engineer working with people across Europe and around the world on a wide range of European projects, and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. There we go. Any questions? Oh, that was great, Paul. Thank you very much. So one question that I have is when you thinking back to when you were actually at school, did you know that this is what you wanted to do? No, I, I to be honest, I don't recall ever talking to um, a what do they call them? Um, like a careers, careers, of, careers yeah. officer. I don't recall ever talking to a careers officer. Um, I was always very practical at school. I preferred um uh you know uh, uh, subjects like woodwork metalwork technical drawing to some of the other subjects history and geography you know i wasn't really ever interested in them physics and chemistry and maths i, I quite enjoyed you know um, and most of the work i i did relied upon you know the basics of physics that i learned at school and certainly maths that i learned at school and uh, and when i was i learned when i was studying as an apprentice you know um so i knew i wanted to be an engine uh, a mechanical engineer i knew i wanted to be involved in making things and fixing things and to be honest i i just fell into the job that i felt that i ended up doing um i when i finished uh, my apprenticeship with the company in Luton, they didn't have a job for me. So I just wrote to all the engineering companies within sort of 30 miles of where I lived. Uh, and I ended up at Stevenage. And um, like I say, I really enjoyed it, you know. Uh, and it was a very good working environment. It, it was very uh, friendly, very... Uh, um, people were encouraged to develop themselves. Uh, and it, it was very easy to go and talk to people. If you didn't understand how to do something, um, you could just go and talk to somebody and they would help you, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, and there wasn't a blame culture if things went wrong, uh, because, you know, we understood that people people make mistakes. Um, and uh, sometimes rocket science is not easy, you know, it's difficult. Um, oh, and when great. you're working at the extremes of uh, of what's capable sometimes, um, then thing, things don't always go right. Um, but, you know, looking back, um, when things go wrong, that's when you, you learn the most. You know, if everything went right every day, then you'd never learn anything. You know. Yeah, I think a lot of our STEM ambassadors have said that as well. They've, they've all kind of said you have to fail to be able to succeed. Yes. Definitely. Thank you ever so much, Paul. I'm going to stop the recording.